My name is Rick Ashley. I am from Texas, uh, from Fort Worth to be exact. Uh, I've been at a church there called The Hills uh, for almost 26 years. Uh, just so you will know, uh, I love Jesus. I love the Bible. I don't think cats are going to be in heaven. <laughs> and to all the Green Bay Packers in the house, I don't care what you say, Des Bryant caught the ball. So that's who I am. And this is my 33rd year to speak at the Pepperdine Bible Lectures. So you can do the math. I have been around the track a few times. I hopefully I have a few more laps left. But um, because I have been to Pepperdine so many times, my children, as they grew up, heard lots and lots of stories about Pepperdine. So uh, I have three kids. My middle child's a girl. And when Morgan was a junior in high school, uh, I took her and a couple of nieces on a little vacation to the L.A. area. Uh, and we went to the beach and we did the things that you do in L.A. And one day uh, I took them to see the campuses of some of the beautiful colleges. We went to USC, we went to UCLA, and then I said, girls, would you like to go up to Malibu and see the Pepperdine campus? You've heard me talk about it all these years. And so we came up Pacific Coast Highway. We came to the campus. This was in about March. I think the school was on their spring break, so not many people were here. But we pulled outside the Firestone Fieldhouse just to walk around. And we walked into the Fieldhouse. And the men's volleyball team from Pepperdine was having a practice. <laughs> This was the year after they had won the national championship. It was a room full of Greek gods, okay? <laughs> they were all six, seven, blonde, cut. They could jump and touch the ceiling. And my little girl left and said, Daddy, can I go to Pepperdine? <laughs> now, we had raised her to go to ACU where her mother and I went, but she wound up at Pepperdine. It was the most expensive vacation I ever took. <laughs> so she got a degree from Pepperdine, and she came back to Texas, and she worked a year. And then she came and said, Dad, all my life I've known I was really wanted to be a nurse. So she enrolled in nursing school, and she is graduating uh, Friday night. So I'm very proud of her, but that is why for the first time in 33 years, I will not be at Pepperdine on Friday. Instead of a three-day class, this is a two-day class. And uh, I will leave tomorrow after class and catch a flight back to Texas so that I can drive out to Abilene for her uh, ceremony on Friday. So I just want to explain that up front. Uh, the series I'm going to do uh, is two lessons called uh, The Parting Gift, and it's actually a part of a series I did at my church at the Hills uh, called The Parting Gift, and it was actually a six sermon. So if you want to hear more teaching on this subject, if you get intrigued, you can go to our website and download more of the teaching. But that's why I can't stay uh, for all three days, and I apologize about that. But you know what? I've paid for a second degree, and I'm going to watch her walk across that stage. <laughs> so... Um, it's a big game. It's the championship game in the high school. Uh, it's late in the game, just a couple of minutes left. Score's tied. Star quarterback gets hurt. And the coach has to put in the backup quarterback. And he's a boy, and what shall we say? He, he had some athletic ability, but let's just say he did not have a high football IQ. And so the coach tells him, uh, the play to run. He brings his team up to the line of scrimmage. And everyone hears him at the line of scrimmage. He calls an audible. He changes the play. They all hear him yell, 14! 14! He turns, he hands the ball to the running back who goes right up the middle, a huge hole, all the way to the end zone. They win the game. Everyone is excited. Everyone, frankly, is stunned. The coach finds that boy after the game and said, Son, what possessed you to change that play? He says, Coach, I got up to the line of scrimmage and I saw those two big old linebackers in front of me, biggest old boys I ever saw, number six and number seven, and I just added it up and called 14.
and the coach says, son, seven plus six does not equal 14. And the boy says, coach, if I was as smart as you, we'd have lost the game. <laughs> okay, so, when you read the story of the early church in Acts, how did they win, considering the odds against them? This little movement lacked educational resources. These were not trained, schooled men. They lacked financial resources. They had no status. They had no political clout. How did they launch a movement that in one generation would affect the world and 2,000 years later is still impacting the world? How could that happen? Well, they did have the best gift ever. And so I wanted to do some teaching in my church on the Holy Spirit. And there's so much you can read about the Holy Spirit. There are so many books. There are so many theologies that have been written. But it came uh, to me one day, why don't you just start with Jesus? And so I haven't finished all the teaching I want to do in my church about the Holy Spirit, but I just decided the first series I do, we're just going, what did Jesus say about the Holy Spirit? Call me simple, but I just really do believe the best place to start when you want to understand anything is, well, what did Jesus say? And so I concentrated in all six of those lessons on John 14 through 16. And you'll remember the context of what we call the Upper Discourse. Upper room discourse. Here's Jesus. And he has been urging his disciples to leave everything and follow him. And they did. And now Jesus is talking about leaving. And if you read those three chapters, ten separate times Jesus says, I am going away. So the disciples are understandably, incredibly sad. But Jesus isn't. Because he knew something they didn't know. And in John 16, 5 through 7, Jesus says, Now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you ask me, where are you going? Rather, you're filled with grief. Because I've said these things. Well, of course they are. They have left everything to follow a man who now says, I'm going to leave you. But, very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. They're thinking, this is as bad as it can get. And Jesus is saying, oh no, the best is yet to come. Now he's not talking about circumstances because in the discourse he says, tough times are ahead. They're going to arrest you. They're going to take you before the authorities. In fact, the day is coming when if somebody kills you, they're going to think they did God a favor. Okay? So when Jesus says the best is yet to come, He's not talking about circumstances. He's telling them up front, it is going to be hard. And so how does He want them to respond? He doesn't tell them to face an uncertain future by reading more Torah. He doesn't tell them to think more positively. He doesn't even tell them to depend on each other more. And he doesn't try to comfort them by answering all their questions. The only thing they needed to know was this. I am going to send the Holy Spirit to you. The best gift ever. He said, it is for your good. 
Other translations. It is profitable for you. It is expedient for you. It is to your advantage. It is better for you. Or I'm going to do what is best for you. And the disciples had a hard time believing that. And we do too. I mean, wouldn't you rather have Jesus right beside you in the flesh than Jesus in heaven at the right hand of God and the Holy Spirit indwelling? But that's what Jesus is saying. So what we're going to do is we're going to just let Jesus inform us and maybe even change our minds about the best gift ever. Because going back to what I said at the start, here's the foundation. Jesus had the best view of the Holy Spirit. And you're never going to appreciate the Holy Spirit like you should until you appreciate how much He meant to Jesus. Because Jesus thought the Holy Spirit was the best. And His view was formed by intimate personal experience. Wouldn't we all agree that Jesus lived the best life ever? That no life has ever been lived that was more fully human, more fully what God intended when He created man, than the life Jesus lived. And I'm telling you, it was because of the Holy Spirit. It says in John, or Luke 4, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Okay, that wasn't a unique day in the life of Jesus. That's how Jesus lived every day. When you read the Gospels, if you start to look for references to the Holy Spirit, you might be surprised how often they show up. For example, Luke 1, we know Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. How can this be? Because I'm a virgin. The Holy Spirit will overshadow you. It says in Acts 10, you remember when Peter was preaching, that Jesus anointed by the Holy Spirit went around doing good, healing people of their diseases and casting out demons. So Jesus did His ministry in the power and enabling of the Holy Spirit. Luke 10, 21 says Jesus was full of joy through the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know when you think of Jesus, what comes to your mind. But when you think of Jesus, do you ever think of Him smiling? The Bible says He was full of joy. And it was through His relationship to the Holy Spirit. Or Hebrews 9.14 says Jesus offered His life through the power of the Spirit. Where did Jesus find the courage and the tenacity and the will to go to that cross? He went to the cross enabled by the Holy Spirit. And you know Romans 8.11 says He was raised from the dead in the power of the Holy Spirit. And then you get over to Acts 1 verse 2. It says He spent His last 40 days giving, it says, final instructions on the kingdom through the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Okay, so from the moment He is conceived until the moment He ascends to heaven, Jesus did life bathed in, enabled by, empowered in, from the powering of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was Jesus' helper. And Jesus knew that His disciples needed help. And so he knew exactly the gift to sin. And in this first teaching, I'm just going to have two very simple but powerful points. Here's point number one. Jesus said the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is not Jesus' light. He is not God on a diet. He is not God on the JV, not quite God enough to be varsity. He is the third person of the Godhead. He is not the third wheel of the Godhead. So the parting gift is not less of Jesus. He is all of God. 
Jesus said to them, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But he could have just as well said, if you've seen the Holy Spirit, you have seen me. 2 Corinthians 13, 14 says, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now, why is that important? Okay, listen. You can have fellowship with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is not a wonderful power. He is a powerful person. He's not a ghost. He's not a fog. The Holy Spirit is God. And you ought to look sometime at the verbs the Bible gives to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit speaks and prays. He decides and He guides. He rejoices He can be grieved, and He can be lied to. You see, this is important because a power is to be used, but a person is to be known. And so, for example, there's this story in Acts 8 where uh, Peter is doing ministry up in Samaria. And there's a man, formerly a sorcerer, named Simon, who's watching Peter do this ministry in the power of the Holy Spirit. And he offers to pay for the power. And go back and read. Peter turns and he gives Simon one of the most sobering and severe rebukes you will ever read in the Bible. Why? Because you don't buy God. You don't control God. You don't domesticate God. You don't use God. And the Holy Spirit is God. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit is like the wind. He blows wherever He pleases. Now, this is important because, and I'll get to this in a moment, a lot of times in our churches, especially in our tribe of Churches of Christ, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, people get really, really nervous. And one of the reasons is because the Holy Spirit is often compared to fire. And so if we're going to let the Holy Spirit in our church, we want a controlled burn. (laughs) But you don't control God. The Holy Spirit is a gift, but not a gift that you can put in a box. But here's what I really want to get to today. Why would we ever need to fear the gift of the Spirit of God? Why, especially in many of our churches, has talk of the Holy Spirit produced anxiety and fear? Why is it that many of us grew up in churches where the only series we ever heard on the Holy Spirit were titled, What the Holy Spirit Doesn't Do? A man wrote a letter to a small hotel he planned to visit on his vacation. He said, I'd, be very, I'd very much like to bring my dog with me. He's well-groomed. He's very well-behaved. It would be okay if he stayed in the room with me one night. And he got an immediate reply back from the hotel owner. I've been operating this hotel for many years, and all that time I've never had a dog steal towels, bedclothes, silverware, or pictures off the walls. I've never had to evict a dog in the middle of the night for being drunk and disorderly. I've never had a dog run out on a hotel bill. Yes, indeed, your dog is welcome at my hotel, and if your dog will vouch for you, you're welcome to stay here too. (laughs) What has the Holy Spirit ever done that we are afraid for him to come to our church. Because here's the second point. Holy Spirit's God. Jesus said the Holy Spirit is good. He's good. Jesus knew better than anyone that the fellowship and the ministry of the Holy Spirit is the best. And as we're going to see in coming uh, tomorrow at least... 
He couldn't see enough good things about the goodness of the Holy Spirit. And so go back again, and if you'll look at the different translations of those chapters, what word Jesus used. Some translate him the advocate, some the friend, some counselor, some comforter, and my favorite, helper. The Holy Spirit helps us. And that's why the parting gift excited God as much as Jesus. You know, a lot of what Jesus taught about prayer really comes down to your understanding of what kind of God is God? What's His heart like? What's His character like? It was so radical when Jesus said, you can call Him Father, you can call Him Daddy when you talk to Him. That's the kind of God you're talking to. And so one time, right after teaching us how to pray, He says, now listen, you're dads, aren't you? If your son asked you for a piece of bread, would you give him a snake? If your daughter asked you for an egg, would you give her a scorpion? He says, how much more then, if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit? To those who ask Him. God wants to add a supernatural dimension to your life. You were never intended to do life, especially life after Jesus, in your own strength. You need help. You've all put up Christmas trees and you decorate them and they're very lovely and they're very ornate and beautiful. And we all take pictures of the kids by the tree. But we don't keep those trees in the house. Why not? Because no matter how much you decorate them on the outside, they are not attached, connected to life. They have been cut off from the source of life. There's a difference between a Christmas tree and a fruit tree. Because the only way a tree can bear fruit is if it is connected to life from the source. Do you know anybody at your church is decorated on the outside and dead on the inside? That's what religion is good at. Religion is good at ornamentation. But it cannot generate spiritual life. You need help. And he has a name. The Spirit of God. And nothing the Holy Spirit is going to do in your life needs to be restrained or controlled or boxed up by somebody's theology. Because to fear the Holy Spirit is to question the goodness of God. And yet we have. And so what I want to do the rest of this teaching is just ask the question, why? Have we not been as grateful as we ought to be for the gift of the Holy Spirit? Why has talk of the Spirit made us nervous and anxious? Why in some of our churches have we even said we don't want that here? I'm going to give you three possible reasons. Number one is what I'm going to call negligent theology. Now... I'm assuming I'm talking to a room full of people who are following Jesus. If you didn't grow up in a church, if you're not a Christian, you don't know anything about the Holy Spirit, I understand that. But a lot of us, we grew up in church. And we still don't know anything about the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Some of us were raised in churches that intentionally ignored the Holy Spirit. 
And here's why I think we did. Because the dilemma for us was how to reconcile the powerful activity of the Spirit in the Bible with the seeming absence of His mighty work in our church. We read in the early chapters of Acts a church that is exploding, a church that is expanding, a church that is dying for its faith and doing so rejoicing. And at our church, we can't even get people to stand up and move forward a few rows to be closer together. (laughs) And so, we developed theologies to justify the difference. For example, some of us grew up hearing, the Holy Spirit only operates today through the Bible, which is a theology you can never read in the Bible. Or we did this interesting cafeteria style pick and choose thing where we would read John 14 through 16 and we'd pick one verse and say, that's for everybody. And then we'd pick another verse and say, that's just for the apostles. Okay, listen to this verse. John 14, 16. I will ask the Father and He will give you another advocate to help you and be with you Forever. So how many generations is Jesus promising the Spirit will help? Let me ask you, does the church need help today? Yes. Yes. And so, we need to be suspicious of any theology that puts the Holy Spirit on tranquilizers. Be suspicious of any theology that says he came to help the church then, but he's not helping the church today like that. So, one thing I'm going to ask you to do is, uh, since we obviously in two days are not going to do a whole theology of the Holy Spirit, is if you decide to launch into a personal journey of growth in understanding the Holy Spirit, let me just ask you to pray that your mind will be open to perhaps receiving new insights into the work of the Holy Spirit that you've never seen before. Because negligent theology has hurt us and deprived us of what Jesus said is a wonderful gift. Here's a second reason. Negative experiences. Some of us somewhere in our past we had a negative experience with some person and their understanding of the Holy Spirit and so we overreacted and just kind of shut down any thought. I speak from experience because that happened to me. So I'm a senior in college. I'm wanting to be a preacher. I was trying to follow Jesus. I think I had a reputation on campus as someone who took faith seriously. I hear about a group of students that are gathering in someone's home on Saturday evenings for a worship experience, and I understand they're quite powerful. And I knew several of the people. So I asked them the next time they met if I could come. And I was told that I was not invited to their gatherings because... I was not, like them, full of the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know what they were full of. (laughs) But it wasn't the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit should unite Jesus' disciples, not divide them. And any time an elitist spirit develops in the body of Christ, where some of us have and some of us don't have, that spirit is not holy. Listen to me. The Holy Spirit does not make you better than anyone else. He makes you better than yourself. And so, 
perhaps as you start your own journey in growth in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, it would be helpful for you to identify past experiences that have become hindrances to your appreciation. Don't let something that happened in the past keep you from moving forward in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Okay, negligent theology, negative experiences. But here's, I think, the biggest reason. Nominal discipleship. Most Christians can live quite successfully without an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. Given our talents and our resources, we don't need any help to achieve a fairly comfortable lifestyle. Because in most of our churches, the bar of discipleship has been set so low that as long as you're a pretty nice person, a decent neighbor, you pay your taxes, you stay out of jail, and you don't cuss much, you're a disciple. I don't need supernatural help to do that. And so we settle for a tepid, insipid, mediocre brand of discipleship that demands little more of us than to be good citizens and pleasant neighbors. Soren Kierkegaard, uh, in his book, Purity of Heart is to Will One Thing, has a little parable he tells about a town of ducks. And every Sunday the ducks would waddle out of their houses down Main Street and they'd waddle to the church and they'd waddle up the steps. They'd waddle into the sanctuary and waddle into their pews. The duck choir would waddle out into the loft. The duck pastor would waddle up to the pulpit and he would preach, ducks! God gave you wings with wings you can fly, with wings you can mount up and soar like eagles. No walls can confine you. No fences can hold you. You have wings. God has given you wings and you can fly, ducks. You can fly. And all the ducks would shout amen. And then they'd get up and waddle home <laughs> just to do it again the next week. Okay, so here's the point. If you're already comfortable, why do you need a comforter? So many of us have accepted as normal a brand of discipleship, a way of following Jesus that is so easy. We don't need any help. And I think the greatest unspoken anxiety about welcoming the Holy Spirit is that when Jesus said, it is good for us, I trust my definition of what's good for me better than God's. Because here's the truth about all of us. We like to lead. We don't like to be led. And the very essence of discipleship is fellowship. The mission of your church, my church, I don't care what the slogan is on your bulletin, I don't care what the mission statement is on your website, the mission of all of our churches is the exact same. We are to make and we're to grow followers of Jesus. And if you and I are going to radically follow Jesus, if I am going to live more like and love more like Jesus, I need some help. And Jesus made it available. I'd say it like this, Jesus did what is best for us so we could be our best for Him. And just like those first disciples, we live in a world that is full of uncertainty and hostility and we are the underdogs. And by the way, stop whining on Facebook. Stop ranting because the government or Hollywood or somebody else doesn't make the Christian agenda the first most important thing, okay? 
Part of our problem today in the church is we got so used to thinking we were the home team that when we finally figured out we've always been the visiting team, we fuss about it. We have always been the visiting team, okay? We've never been on home turf. And the truth of the matter is, historically, we are at our best when we're the visiting team, and we know it. And we live as an alien community, as exiles, as a countercultural minority empowered by the Holy Spirit to offer to the world, to butt up against the world with a completely different alternative way to live. And Jesus sends us into that world to live like Him, to love like Him. And we're going to need help. We need more of the Spirit if we're going to make more of a difference. And I'll talk a little bit more tomorrow then about what does that mean then to live in the power of the Spirit, to, to be filled with the Spirit. And let me just close with this thought. You're afraid that if you really embrace the theology of the Spirit, if you really seek the leading of the Spirit, if you really give the Holy Spirit permission to do whatever He wants to do and not what some theology says He's allowed to do, that you'll become weird. The Holy Spirit will not make you weird. He will make you more like Jesus, which will make you strange <laughs> in the most wonderful way. Let me uh, just use it, one example of someone we're all aware of because he's on our campus. But think about Dr. Kent Brantley. When we first got word last summer that he had contracted Ebola, that he was being flown back to this country. Many assumed it was probably a death sentence. And like you, I joined with countless thousands fasting and praying for his health, asking God for a miracle. But I would like to suggest one other thing that I think many missed. We had already witnessed a miracle. Here was a man who had all the resources, all the talents, all the training to live the American dream. To know nothing but a life of comfort. And what's he doing? He's spending his time on mission for God, serving people on the margin of the margins. Who does that? That's not natural. That is supernatural. I praise God for the miracle of His healing, but I'm telling you, the fact that He was there where He could get sick was a miracle. It was a powerful witness of what happens when somebody surrenders to the best gift ever. Jesus' death was not the end of His plan. Even Jesus' resurrection was not the end of his plan. He said, I must go back to the Father so that I can send the Holy Spirit. Because that is best. And friends, when you receive a gift like that, you ought to say, thank you. And I just wonder, have you ever done that? Have you ever just thanked God for the Holy Spirit. Because that's how we're going to close. Bow your heads. I'm going to give you about 20 seconds to 30. Take a moment. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. And ask God to help you get over any hurdle from your past, either teaching or experience, that has kept you from fully Embracing the gift. Do that for just a moment. Oh God, help us to understand that you are a good Father. You only 
do what is best for your children. Help us to believe that Jesus is a good deliverer. He would only send what would bless and forgive us for receiving a gift that we would keep in the box. And free us, God, with joy to experience the full blessing of the help of the Holy Spirit. For Jesus' sake, amen. Thank you for coming and have a great day.